Harvard, uh, and now I think that he's a faculty actually at uh, Hawaii University. Is that true? Or yeah, you can you can actually you can just yeah high five sorry university. So he's gonna to talk about photon ring autocorrelations are a natural target for the NGHG, which is super great. Please take it away. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks very much, Razi. It's great to see you and everybody. Um, so, uh, and thanks to Daniel Palumbo uh, for, for the great uh, movie. Can I get a sound check? Sorry? Okay. So, yeah, I'm going to tell you about photon ring autocorrelations and the relation to NGEHT. So, but first, since this is the photon ring um, session, so I'm going to tell you very quickly about photon rings in general. Uh, so uh, how do we compute an image of a black hole? So we have two parts. The part that's the, the matter in the accretion disk that generates uh, the light and the part which is the geometry which lenses the light. So uh, let's assume uh, for now that we know what the matter is doing because of course that's a very complicated problem, but we will focus on the lensing because also the photon ring is of course a universal effect. So let's assume that we know what the matter is doing and how it's emitting. The way we compute the image of a, uh, of a black hole is we take an observer screen far away from the black hole and we shoot back into the geometry null geodesics. Uh, each location on the screen is an impact, per oops, an impact parameter for a geodesic. Um, and, and we follow the geodesic into the uh, emission and we see how many photons it picks up according to the radiative transfer equation. So, uh, in general, photon ring images have, uh, sorry, black hole images have a, a critical curve, which separates between um, light rays that fall eventually into the black hole horizon and light rays that go back to infinity. That's called the critical curve. Um, and if we if we shoot a light ray very close to to this critical values, which is a one parameter family of critical values of uh, of impact parameters, we get a bright brightness enhancement because this uh, light ray will go into the geometry and then orbit the black hole multiple times before it either goes into the horizon or flies off to infinity. So it picks up more and more photons as it does that. So we get a brightness enhancement, very close, exponentially close to the critical curve, exponentially in the number of turns. Uh, and that's the photon ring. Uh, in this, this is in a movie. So we have the, the bulk of the emission is emission that is only weakly lensed by the black hole. It doesn't go any extra turns around the black hole, but it picks up photons and then comes to our screen. And then we have the n equals one photons, which undergo half orbit on, uh, around the black hole and get to our screen. And they already arrive much, much closer to the critical curve. And then we have the n equals two photons, which arrive even closer to the critical curve. And they undergo two half orbits or one full orbit around the black hole before they reach our screen. So they already uh, constitute a very sharp uh, feature on the image. And in the end, uh, the image is uh, a superposition of all these contributions, of course. And it gives this kind of simulated images that we're uh, familiar with. Okay, so the, the photon ring is due to near critical light rays and, and let's talk a little bit about them. So this is the uh, photon ring, which is the, the feature on the screen. Okay, following very closely the critical curve. And we have a corresponding region in the geometry near the black hole, which we call the photon shell, in which we have actually these critical photon orbits undergoing uh, orbits under the, under the uh, orbiting the black hole. And they exist between two different radii, a minimal one and a maximal one. Uh, so this radius parameterizes, if you want, the one parameter family of photon orbits. And it, it is exactly this one parameter family which also parameterizes the critical curve or the photon ring that follows it closely. So there is a, a really uh, counterintuitive effect here that as you look around the critical curve, so you're looking at different angles in the sky, you're actually looking at different radii in the geometry. 
Okay, so you aim to a different angle around the critical curve and you reach actually a uh, near critical photon orbit in a different radius in the geometry. So these uh, near critical light rays have, the, so they're parameterized by the radius in the geometry, R tilde, but they have corresponding critical parameters, which kind of control uh, everything that they're doing in this near critical regime. One of them is the Lyapunov exponent, gamma, which controls how fast or slow the light ray uh, approaches or recedes to this critical uh, radius R tilde. Okay, this is kind of the ratio between the, dist between the distance in the kth orbit and the k plus one orbit is e to the minus gamma. And we have two additional critical parameters, which are the orbital, the temporal period, sorry, and the azimuthal period of the orbit in the geometry. As the orbit kind of, uh, as, as this light ray orbits the black hole, it, it uh, has some azimuthal period delta here and some temporal period tau here between every, uh, for every, for every half orbit. Okay. Great. So that's the photon ring in general. Okay. That was, that took me some time. Okay. Uh, so why is it interesting to observe the photon ring? Well, it's universal. It depends really for, for a large range of, of, uh, of, uh, of matter configurations that are optically thin. Uh, it's there and it depends only on the geometry and not on the, uh, on the matter, which is nice if we want to measure things about the black hole. So it measures the black hole mass and spin, and it also uh, offers an opportunity to test GR, either by measuring the shape of the photon ring or by measuring, for example, the demagnification at every point along the critical curve, there's a demagnification controlled exactly by this Lyapunov exponent gamma. So both of these proposed uh, uh, measurements are, uh, are done by measuring the time averaged specific intensity along the photon ring. The time averaged image, if you want. So, so, uh, so one way to observe the photon ring would be to go to, to perform a precision measurement of the brightness on the screen. Here, rho and phi are uh, polar coordinates on the screen, as you see here. So if you measure the time average image well enough with good enough resolution, we can do that. And, and now actually we heard in the fundamental physics group that maybe we can go in frequency uh, even uh, higher than I at least thought. And that would be great for resolution. Uh, another option, which I want to uh, promote today is to look at more observables. Um, perhaps the ones that are even good when you don't have enough resolution in the image. And specifically, I'm going to talk about image autocorrelations or spatio-temporal autocorrelations in the image along the photon ring. So this is the observable that I'm going to talk about. It's a two-point correlation function of the fluctuations of the brightness on the screen at different times and different angles. And notice that we're integrating over rho here, the, the radial coordinate, the radial polar coordinate. So we're kind of um, we're just thinking about this photon ring as a one plus one dimensional object with an angle and a time. And we're just integrating over this direction, integrating over the whole photon ring in the radial direction. So we have just a ring and we're thinking about the ring with fluctuations along it, which arise from fluctuation in the emission, of course, but they have to be correlated. They have to be correlated because any, oops, any kind of event here, like a flare, for example, in the accretion disk, will generate multiple images on the screen. But if this emission is fluctuating in the screen, then every single event will have these multiple images at different times and different positions along the ring, but they're correlated since they arose from the same event. So, uh, so there have to be some correlations in, in the ring brightness. And, uh, and, and I'll show you in, in a second how you can find them. Um, I just want to comment that indeed uh, it seems that there is high variability in, in, in the sources that are relevant to us. Uh, we saw that from the first EHT papers and, and, and also uh, from uh, Maciek et al's paper and, uh, and we know that about Sajay star too. So there's high variability and these are a, a very partial list of, of studies of type dependence in black hole imaging. 
so so I, I think that maybe for for the time average image variability is problematic it could cause noise but in general variability is our friend because it can help us uh, with other observables like this one if we have variability that actually helps so it's it's kind of complementary in that sense so this is a, a beautiful movie uh, generated by Daniel. Uh, it's a simulation of Sagay star. And you can see there is high variability and, um, um, and you can see even the photon ring in this, uh, in this uh, simulation. And the proposal is to measure the autocorrelations along the photon ring in two different places, and then to compute the two point correlation function um, okay, which is roughly this, oops, this quantity, um, uh, in these, uh, two positions along the ring. However, this is not what we're really going to see with the, uh, what we see with the EHD and, and not what we're going to see with the NGHD because there is finite resolution. So if you blur the simulation, that's what you're going to see roughly. Uh, this is, of course, not, not an accurate simulation, but just for, uh, for the purpose of um, illustration. So we're going to see something which is more like this, uh, an unresolved ring, and of course, the, the whole uh, the whole uh, uh, profile that we see, which looks roughly similar to, to what uh, the image we have, it will be improved, but it won't be improved by order of magnitude, uh, the resolution. So it's we probably will not be able to resolve the photon ring. Uh, but maybe we can maybe we can uh, if we're lucky we can resolve the n equals one. Um, and, and, and what I want to say is that actually even having this kind of image in which the photon ring is uh, not resolved could allow us to measure it in an indirect way through these autocorrelations. Okay, and I'll get back to that. So how does this, um, how does this lensing work? How, uh, so what, what's the result for the autocorrelations? I don't have so much time to explain that. But in general, every fluctuation, if we, if we take a polar view for simplicity, every kind of fluctuation we have of the brightness in the image will have another image, n equals one image, n equals two image, n equals three. And they will be related in the universal regime by these critical exponents, tau, delta, time delay, and gamma by the, by the total flux in the image and also the closeness to the critical curve. So kind of all these three critical parameters enter the calculation uh, for, for these photon ring autocorrelations. And the result that we get for this two point correlation function as a function of the uh, temporal separation between the points and the angular separation between the points, this is for a polar observer, we get, um, we get several peaks. So this central red peak is a peak that you will always have uh, when you compute the autocorrelations because the fluctuations are local but you will get additional peaks that are separated by, um, in time, they're separated by the period tau. In azimuth, they're separated by the uh, azimuthal period delta. Okay, and, and they're also suppressed in amplitude by e to the minus gamma. So you can see all these critical exponents coming in, uh, in this result. This is an analytical result for a, for a simplified model of an accretion disk, but it's an analytical result for Kerr. Shahar? Yeah. I apologize. Uh, how much more do you, how much more? Uh, do you two have? more slides? Yeah. yeah, because I think we are at 13 minutes. Okay. okay. Just say uh, quick, I apologize. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm, I'll, I'll go, go very, very fast. So there's uh, observational advantages, um, which, uh, which I was talking about. And basically, the main point is we do not need to resolve the width of the ring. Okay. We only need. Uh, we can do this with the angular resolution we have, and we have good enough temporal resolution because the time scales are, are not a problem for us at all. Okay, so what we need to do is actually look at this ring. Let's say this is our angular resolution. It allows us to divide this into bins like this. 
So all we need to do is measure the other correlations between two points um, like this, for example, and we can compute our observable. Even with such an angular resolution, we could still have a result because we have good enough temporal resolution. Okay, and that's the main point. So I think that, and of course, because NGHT is an Earth-based mission and it's limited in resolution, I think this really means that um, the photon ring autocorrelations are a natural target for NGHT for something with not good enough angular resolution, but good enough temporal resolution. Thank you. Sorry for going over time. No, thank you so much. That was very fantastic talk and congratulations for a very interesting result. Unfortunately, we don't have any time for question. I, um, I encourage that the next speaker, please uh, upload your actually your slide. But uh, between that, uh, somebody was actually about to ask a question. Can you please uh, direct it either to the chat or in a Slack window? And again, I, I really encourage us to uh, keep the talks short so that people can ask questions. Apologies, really, but yeah. So the second question, uh, a street horn trap to party, actually. Apologies. Yeah, I think you are the you are the speaker, aren't you? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So we have a great pleasure. Uh, to hear now from our second speaker, who is an astrophysicist from the Center for Astrophysics. He's going to talk about observing the photon ring in the near term, Alma Sophia VIBI. So please take it. You are muted. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the photon ring has been pop popping up everywhere recently, especially in the theoretical context. And today I'm going to talk to you about the possibility of observing the photon ring in the near term using Alma Sophia VLBI. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge helpful exchanges with Michael Johnson in this context. Okay, so these two images are here um, to invoke the uh, black hole and the photon ring guards respectively. Uh, Sahar has already given a good introduction to the topic and looking at the photon ring a little bit more closely in this uh, plot from uh, the Johnson et al paper, uh, which shows the visibility amplitude profile as a function of uh, baseline length. Um, you see that at about 20 giga lambda, uh, there is a demarcation between the astrophysics dominated region and the photon ring dominated region. And I want you to note here in this plot that um, um, the, the detection of this uh, profile itself is a test of uh, general relativity and also um, the ability to measure the periodicity and the difference between the blue and the red curves here, which are for baselines that are perpendicular and parallel to the, uh, to the spin axis uh, bring constraints on the parameters. Uh, the lower uh, panel, which is also from the same paper, uh, breaks the, uh, the photon ring signature into n equals one, two, and three. And uh, one would like to get as close to the photon ring dominated region here as possible. And if you want to do that, you can see that you need to go to very high resolutions, uh, which means correspondingly very long baselines. Um, the uh, Johnson et al. paper also looked at this, and this is presented in the lower panel. Uh, where uh, the vertical axis is uh, frequency. And a given physical baseline here uh, is represented as a diagonal line. And as you can see, uh, the EHT uh, doesn't come anywhere near the, near the uh, photon ring dominated region. And if you want to reach that, you either have to go to higher frequencies or go to space, a low earth orbit, a medium earth orbit, and even further on if you want to go after the other rings. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to, uh, okay, so all these uh, space mission uh, possibilities um, use ALMA as, the, as an anchor station on the ground to bring uh, sensitivity so that you can actually make measurements on this. And I'm going to try and tell you today that it may be possible to do this in the near term without going to space 
and uh, uh, using SOFIA, and this may really be the only way to do it in the near term. So I'm going to start by singing the praises of SOFIA to make the case. SOFIA, by the way, is the Stratospheric Observatory for Far Infrared Astronomy. This is a 2.7 meter antenna that uh, is, uh, uh, is a joint NASA uh, German DLR project, and it takes the antenna uh, up above the troposphere, so leaving uh, all the tropospheric, I mean, atmospheric muck uh, behind. And I'd like to start by defining the concept of uh, SOFIA equivalent VLBI ground antenna. The primary mode of operation for SOFIA is to observe in uh, atmospheric opaque windows, obviously, but there is unique value even in atmospheric transmission windows. And this is in the context of key, key VLBI observations, that is high resolution observations, which by definition would require you to be observing at very low elevations. Uh, at such low elevations, the ground-based uh, telescopes suffer uh, uh, big air masses, and so they lose sensitivity, and so, and which SOFIA does not because it flies above the atmosphere, uh, the troposphere. Uh, the SOFIA, the lowest elevations that SOFIA can go to are 20 to 23 degrees, where the air masses are 2.5 to 3. And uh, uh, one can define these equivalent ground antenna apertures uh, considering sites on the ground. Here at 340 gigahertz, looking at Monarchia, the equivalent aperture is about 10 meter. And looking at 690 gigahertz, where we go to Chagnantar, because Monarchia is not a good enough site for 690 really. And looking at the first octile and the second octile weather on Chagnantar, the equivalent aperture is 12 to 20 meter. And even at 230 gigahertz, uh, at nominal four millimeter Monarchia weather, the equivalent size is about five meter. Now one can come to this from the other direction, that is from space, and ask what is the equivalent aperture for a SOFIA uh, for a space antenna. The advantage SOFIA brings is that it is an infrared telescope, which means its surface is of very high quality. Oh, but by the way, these numbers are phenomenal uh, and can be very useful. And uh, the equivalent space aperture for a 30 micron uh, uh, surface accuracy antenna, which is what one might really consider, is about four meters. So keep that number in your mind, four meter, we'll come back to this in a moment. So what can SOFIA do to observe the photon ring? Uh, we go back to our original plot where what EHD can currently do is shown. And ESG can, is, uh, can of course now go to 340 gigahertz and certainly the NGESG, and that's starting to get close to the photon ring dominated region, but not really there. And you bring in SOFIA, specifically SOFIA ALMA at 690 gigahertz, you have now broken into the photon ring dominated region. And uh, when you're going out on a limb, you might as well go all the way. So if you go to 950 gigahertz, you can see that you have gotten quite far. Now it's of course not sufficient to just have the resolution required, you also need the sensitivity. And uh, this one, uh, the task is made easy for me because the Johnson et al. paper again actually estimated sensitivities for a four meter space antenna. And as I mentioned, the SOFIA equivalent operation in space is about four meter. And for SOFIA ALMA, uh, for a 10 mi uh, minute integration, you get about one millijansky to a few millijansky, and the 20 to 30 millijansky uh, flux from the n equals one ring would be detectable. The assumptions made here are 30 gigahertz bandwidth, uh, which is much more easily dealt with by the SOFIA uh, uh, antenna as opposed to a space-based antenna and ALMA type uh, receiver temperatures. Now, all this is good. And uh, so what are the challenges we are going to face in doing this? Of course, the foremost is phase stability, which can lead to coherence losses. Um, now, for a path length error of epsilon, this is how quickly the coherence would uh, drop off washing out the fringes. And in the case of SOFIA, antenna and aircraft movements and jitter will lead to such uh, fluctuations. And we first note that uh, the SOFIA antenna is on an initial reference frame, um, which this is a, um, you know, uh, a technological challenge that uh, the SOFIA project has solved. And uh, yeah, the aircraft actually moves around the telescope here like a shell. That is how it is on an initial reference frame. And to get an estimate of uh, what kind of path length stability one has, we note that at 30 micron, it delivers a diffraction limited uh, PSF of 2.7 arc seconds. 
and uh, the frequency, the wavelengths we are considering are about an order of magnitude uh, larger, and so this should be all right. But the aircraft position and velocity variations are, of course, a big concern. And uh, the way to deal with that, I would suggest, would be for the, through the use of global uh, navigation satellite systems and accelerometers to estimate delay, delay rate, and delay acceleration. I've done some very preliminary explorations here. Uh, there is a lot of relevant work uh, done by the airborne gravimetry community. And interestingly, the DLR, which is the NASA equivalent organization in Germany, which is part of uh, the SOFIA project, is very much involved in these measurements where they fly jet aircraft um, uh, at high speeds uh, to map out the Earth's gravity field. And they measure uh, the position, velocity, and uh, the gravity uh, to very good accuracies, and we can borrow from the knowledge uh, that that's exists in that community. And I also want to note that uh, commercial off-the-shelf microelectromechanical accelerometers provide a uh, deliver very good performance down to 10 nano G per root hertz. And if you integrate that over one kilohertz, the error in acceleration and the error in the position and velocity, which would tra translate to delay and delay rate over one second, are about a few micron. And uh, compared to the 1300 and 434 micron wavelengths that we are looking at, uh, these look very good. I also have had some initial exchanges with the NASA um, Science Mission Directorate and SOFIA people because the involvement of both of them are uh, very, very important for this to go forward. And, uh, I've had encouraging responses from them. <clears throat> so what are some of the preliminary requirements? Uh, as we said, understanding the delay, delay rate, and uh, uh, acceleration measurements and the needs, and the receivers matching relevant ALMA bands. And here, the four great channel one receiver of SOFIA has an overlap with the ALMA band eight, uh, but the bandwidth is limited, but this may be adequate for uh, short baseline tests, which is where one should start. And of course, the SOFIA will need to be provided with frequency and time standards and VLBA backends. And most importantly, a stable SOFIA ALMA NGEST partnership will be required. And another uh, critical requirement would be the ability to operate simultaneously at lower frequencies and at 690 gigahertz. This would be uh, to use the 230 or 340 gigahertz astrophysics signal to provide calibration for the general relativity signal. Basically, to uh, you, you'll be much more easily able to do um, uh, fringe finding at uh, 230 and 340 gigahertz, and uh, the determination from there could then be translated to 699 uh, uh, 50 gigahertz. Excuse me. No. Okay, I think that uh, we are lack of time. How, how much more a slide do you have? This is my last slide. Perfect, okay. Okay, so I, here is quickly a part that I lay out. Uh, so we need to wet and solidify these estimates and develop this concept and uh, accelerometer studies and ways of including accelerometer data and VLBA data reduction, equipping SOFIA with the necessary references and a short baseline proof of concept testing. Um, now, finally, I hope that I have partly convinced you of the viability of this possibility or at least the interest. Going out on a limb gets the best fruits. And I'd like to end by saying that SOFIA ALMA VLBA can enable transformative advances in black hole photon ring studies. And this is within reach in the near term. And this may be the only way to do this in the near term. I'll stop here and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very fantastic talk. Is this any question? I really encourage uh, all the participants to please ask questions. You can either raise your hand or put them on the chat window or just continue the discussions over the Slack channel. So, Venki, please go ahead. Sorry, I think that Sorry, we don't yeah. hear you actually. Sorry. Everybody mute. Hello, I'm not hearing anything. Okay, perfect. Go ahead. Yeah. So the question is, uh, how is the surface that you see and how it comes to the light source? Sorry, it doesn't work. 
Can you put your uh, question? On, I really apologize. Can you put this in the chat window? It seems like that there are some noises. Maybe you are, maybe you are connected to some other things. You know. All right. I apologize. He's uh, he's one of the LOC. So in the meantime, is this any other questions for Sid Rahan? So I have a question. Um, yes. Yeah. Does Sophia normally carry a maser? No, it does not. You'll need to provide uh, uh, a frequency and time reference to Sophia. But Sophia is spacious. And so the, the mass of all this stuff won't be a problem? I do not think so. I mean, I don't know this for a fact. You know, it's a Boeing 747 Four aircraft. Seven. Uh, TK, I have a quick question. The masers typically have to be kept very, very, very stable. Do you think uh, that's possible? Well, uh, mazes have been flown. Uh, you know, there, there's there been uh, space VLB experiments and people have flown mazes. And oh. I think this is possible. No, oh, okay. All right. Thank you so much. That was a very fantastic conversation. I see that Venki also has a question in the chat. I apologize for your lack of the time. Please, the Sidrahan asked her to it again. Uh, please uh, don't hesitate to put your questions and the continuation of the discussions in the Slack window. Uh, so, Magic, do you want to share your screen with us? So, as a I third do want speaker, to try. <laughs> okay, perfect. It seems that if you go to the presentation mode, yeah, play, yeah, perfect, yeah. So it's fine. It looks yeah. good. Yeah, it's okay. my great pleasure to introduce our third speaker, Magic Viegas. Uh, from Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. He was former uh, BHI fellow, and it's a great pleasure to hear about his talk, which is about photon rings of a spherically symmetric black holes and robust tests of non care metrics. So please take it. Okay, hello everyone. Let me just say I, that was the first time I, uh, I heard about the opportunity to observe between Sofia and Alma and I, I think this is absolutely amazing uh, and worth pursuing. One more reason to go into photon ring uh, science, which I will be advocating um, today. Uh, Okay, if I manage to, oh, I can change slides, wonderful, everything works. So let me start with this uh, uh, piece of beautiful uh, eye candy propaganda from the EHT uh, 2019. Uh, here we have uh, the famous observation of the M87 uh, to the left, and we have uh, uh, GRMHD uh, theoretical model. And you see they agree quite nicely that this consistency is reassuring, uh, particularly if you blur uh, this uh, simulation to the resolution of the EHT. These are kind of very similar images. So it makes us all very happy and reassured, but there is always a uh, uh, word, but uh, this is like a necessary uh, condition for us to be able to interpret results of the EHT with, uh, theor uh, within theoretical framework that we are using. It is not a sufficient um, uh, uh, co condition that uh, it looks uh, vaguely, uh, one is a ring, the other is a ring and uh, the brightness asymmetry is, uh, is right. So we think, uh, as uh, uh, Shahar uh, told you a little bit about the structure, substructure of the image. So I will uh, put uh, this uh, substructure slide here and I'll try to point at uh, some different features that we are talking about so that we get the context right. So I am calling shadow uh, here, this uh, overall appearance of, the, of this thing that there is uh, something round and bright with something dark uh, inside. Uh, then there is this sharper feature, a photon ring that uh, uh, Shahar introduced theoretically so well that I will not waste too much time on that. Uh, then there is a critical curve, which is what people often refer to, a, 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 to as a shadow. And this is a purely GR, a purely metric related feature that is independent of uh, any astrophysics. However, it's not an observable of, an, uh, of a true uh, observational experiment. And then there is an inner shadow, which is an interesting, uh, 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 another concept, the inner edge of these um, uh, uh, sharp features uh, that I encourage you to go tomorrow, see the uh, talk by Andrew Chail, who will be, uh, I think, uh, talk uh, more about uh, this uh, inner shadow uh, feature. Okay, so this is the inner structure of this uh, black hole image, but of course, uh, we blur it to the EHT resolution, it's gone, we don't see this uh, feature. So we don't, uh, we do need to go to uh, higher resolution to address the questions of the photon ring science, and hence our hopes 
uh, to uh, advocate uh, that science case to the NGHT and maybe uh, uh, get on with the uh, photon ring science in the near future. So now a few words about uh, motivations. Why do we bother about these uh, sharp uh, features? Uh, so this is the image uh, fr from the uh, one of the papers of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration from 2019, the theory paper, and I kind of uh, hand wavy divided these directions uh, where is spin and there is some parameter of plasma. Uh, so I, uh, I will call those two directions like the axis of space-time ge geometry because spin is space-time geometry and the axis of uh, astrophysics. So this uh, sort of plasma related parameter. And you see that uh, this problem, it uh, kind of, you know, it's kind of degenerate in a sense that uh, the feature that we're looking at, which would be this diffused emission uh, in, in, the, uh, in these figures, uh, it can go be larger or smaller depending both on the space-time metric and on the, uh, on the assumptions about astrophysics. So, uh, so this diffused guy that we are sensitive to with DHT is kind of feeling uh, in a similar way astrophysics and geometry. But there is this uh, nice sharp feature of a photon ring, this is the first uh, photon ring, that is uh, kind of looks very similar between those different um, uh, the, the different, uh, uh, you know, mapping of uh, of parameter uh, space. So there is a hope that maybe this is a robust feature that would really allow us to dig into the uh, properties of the uh, of the system with, with less assumptions. This is the slide that I will just uh, almost skip through because this is explaining what is the photon ring in the, in the simplest geometry, which Shahar did really well. So let me just point to you that. In the, the simple geometry, it basically boils down to one equation to calculate the photon ring structure of space time. Uh, you can see more about this uh, theoretical background in classic, I will, I will call them classic uh, photon ring papers, the Johnson et al, uh, Grana Lubsaska, whole series of such papers from 2020. And I encourage you also to check out uh, my uh, new paper, which, which is talking about these um, uh, uh, different uh, spherically symmetric space times and how uh, photon rings uh, uh, respond to the uh, to this geometry of the space time. This uh, is a, a little fun exercise that we did uh, shortly after the results uh, of the EHT observations uh, came out. So with Frederick Van Son and with a couple of colleagues, we thought about uh, maybe uh, thinking about some wild geometries of some exotic objects. So we <clears> thought, <throat> how about boson stars that people were proposing as an, uh, this sort of exotic mimicker of black holes? How about wormholes that sound even more exotic uh, uh, to, to me? Uh, so we took, we, uh, we generated synthetic images of space times, uh, of uh, accretion disks in both space times. We fitted them to the EHT data, actually. And we got the results from this bottom row. Uh, so we see with the EHT resolution, they really kind of look the same if you, if you blur it. It's all a ring with the brightness asymmetry. Uh, and actually, when you uh, look at those fits, uh, it's not that it's uh, particularly discriminating towards boson stars. They, they, they still provide a good fit to the EHT data. However, if you look at the higher resolution in the top row, you can see that they do look very different because this first guy is a Kerr black hole. It has this one family of photon rings with pronounced first photon ring that you see as this sharp feature. There is no, there are no photon rings in this boson star um, space time here. And, uh, and here for the wormhole, you see just some kind of a quagmire, some mess of many, many photon rings. By the way, I only noticed that an hour ago, but this looks very much like a logo of the NGHT uh, project. So this could be foreshadowing that maybe we go with the NG NGHT, look at those objects and we see something like that. And then it's a wormhole. It's not a, a, not a Kerr black hole. That would be fantastic. I am hoping for that, although I am not really expecting that to uh, to happen to, to seriously. Uh, I think. How am I doing on time, Raz? I think that you have about four to five minutes more. That is yeah. so much time. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. I'm, I'm usually, uh, I take too long and I'm, I got worried. Uh, yeah, but you. if you can make um, it short. I, think I will. I will, I will try. I will, I will zip, zip through some, uh, some more slides. So this is a little bit of a theory something we would call a transfer function, which is the uh, co connection between the emission radius and the position on the observer screen. And this straight line here, you can see how the emission of this direct image uh, uh, depends on the radius of the emission. Where is the position of the ring that EHT is sensitive to? Uh, 
So uh, what kind of systems it corresponds to, uh, that would be to the left, the guy where you have most of the emission uh, in the inner part, and then this uh, direct emission ring, this diffused guy is smaller than the photon ring, and so on. The, uh, if, if the emission is dominated by the uh, uh, electron, electrons farther away, then this direct emission guy will be larger than a photon ring. Anyway, you see sensitivity of the image size on the, uh, on the uh, location of the emission. And when you look at the curves for n equal one, they are very vertical, which means they are insensitive to the location of the emission when you, they provide the location um, uh, uh, on the observer screen. Meaning you could use them to test metric without caring too much about the emission location, which is uh, astrophysics and not, uh, not gravity. Uh, this is a paper of Kocher Lakota et al, uh, who used uh, measurements of the EHT to try to constrain uh, some exotic uh, space times uh, by the size of the of this ring. However, this is using this n equals zero direct emission, which is problematic because of uncertainties in the emission region. So what I did, I repeated that with photon rings, and it turns out that even with first photon ring and some priors, you can uh, get decent uh, constraints on the charges of exotic uh, black hole space times. Uh, this is my pretty much last slide. I, I just want to advertise a couple of other uh, talks about about uh, photon rings. There is Alex Lubsaska talk about some methods he proposed how we could do it with the space VLBI uh, in the future. There is upcoming work that we didn't submit yet with uh, a couple of uh, our uh, co colleagues uh, that elaborates on this method derived by um, uh, Alex and Sam Grala and uh, Dan Marone. Uh, there is also interesting work by uh, Avery Broderick et al. 2021. I think some people from this paper are even uh, around uh, at this call, uh, which is also proposing some ways how we could extract the science of the photon ring uh, from uh, VLBI observations. Uh, last slide, a couple of Conclusions with, I, I even made them red so that I really, you know, push forward the, um, uh, the um, agenda <laughs> that, I, that I have. So my agenda is to tell you that testing gravity with shadows is a degenerate problem. It is difficult. You have to assume something about astrophysics to test gravity or look for observables that do not depend on astrophysics too much. So we cannot do it very well, robustly, quantitatively right now. But photon rings are one of the possible answers how to get to this meaty, interesting part of testing gravity. And probably with NGHT, we could already start looking at least at n equal one first photon ring, or maybe with Sophia and Alma, and we could, uh, we could get there in a couple of years, which would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Really fantastic talk, Magic. Thank you so much for being so much on time. I think that we have time for a few questions, and I already see some of them in the chat window. Uh, okay. Do they actually do the people that ask this question want to speak, or do you want us to actually, you know, talk about their question? That's the first time I made it in on time, so please use time okay. for questions. Yeah, no, that's great, <laughs> Marshall. Uh, do you want to ask yourself? Well, I was just the, the I was curious about the boson star. I mean, I was curious about what sets the escape velocity at its surface, which presumably is less than c, and if that's true, wouldn't that mean it would be bigger for a given mass than that, a, Let uh, me Let me stop you, stop you right there. There is no surface in a boson star. It is a, a, a field of uh, uh, special particles. Uh, so there is, it's like nothingness filled with a special force field uh, that, uh, that is causing these effects on, uh, on space time. But it has a size. It has a size which is uh, defined or uh, with some characteristic uh, decay rate of this uh, field. Uh, so you know and where where, where is the phase? the same as the event horizon size. I mean, uh, this is a parameter. Uh, this is a parameter of the model, and different properties of uh, of boson star depend on this uh, parameter. But it can be comparable to the event horizon. I I think it can. I, I, no, I don't know if it can be smaller. I won't say that. Uh, but uh, this is a free parameter in the model that is constrained uh, by some other constraints that I don't know so well about. I'm sorry, this is a silly question, but is a boson star just a giant Bose-Einstein condensate? No, it's it's not exactly that, but it's also uh, it's more exotic than that. Uh, this is a scalar field of uh, special uh, properties. Uh, 
Okay. The fun thing is that it, it may not have photon rings, uh, at least in some variants of, of this space. It also depends on this, uh, how compact is it, uh, that it may not necessarily possess uh, photon rings because it may not necessarily possess this photon shell uh, structure. Okay, there is another question from Reni, Mari, Chimpan, Chiman, sorry. Do you want to ask your question yourself or Shavi? Shavi, speak about this. Reni, or? Okay, actually she asked, uh, could you show again the slide giving the form of the metric for the modeling of MAD7 as a care black hole or non-care compact object or give paper reference? So that, that, that seems to be better followed on the action on the stack channel. So yeah, there was a slide. There was a slide that um, that he showed. And he, he there was just this um, equation that he wrote that looked like um, um, uh, for that one right there. If I could just look at that for a moment, um, um, please. Yeah, is that is that in a paper? I can I can see more. Yeah, so the, so the paper is in this uh, this uh, archive two one oh nine. This is my paper. The, the figure oh, okay. is from, from, from okay. Two one um, oh nine. Okay. And, As a um, matter of fact, all of the all of the actual talks are being recorded, and they will be in YouTube channel sometime soon. So don't worry if you're missing some slides or whatever. Gopal, uh, you have your hand raised up. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let me just write down. I see the reference. Can I write that two one oh nine? <laughs> um, dot one oh eight four oh um and that's your um uh w i e l g u s two o two thank you so much thank you so much that's it's a, that you. looks very um um very promising to be able to to more carefully um predict and etc okay thank you i don't want to take up time for anyone uh, from anyone else thank, thank you. you so much thank you so, so oh, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you I'll, I'll mute myself now. Thank you. May I ask my question, Razi? Yeah, please. I think that yeah, in the meantime, can I ask the last speaker to please get prepared for uploading your slides? Yeah, but just, just very quickly, please. Okay, very quickly, Macha. Nice talk. Uh, on the boson star, which, you know, there's a degeneracy of interpretation, but uh, if I remember right, boson stars don't have jet phenomena, right? I mean, in, in terms of uh, the photon ring, I, I can imagine that it's hard to distinguish based on our resolution, but if you actually also see jets, can, yeah. can, can that be consistent with the boson star? That's, that, that, that is a good comment, um, and that is uh, uh, reasonable from a point of view that, you know, you won't have uh, Blandford uh, Znajek in the, uh, operating in the same way, at least as in a black hole space time. Uh, however, you, you know, it's not like we did a lot of simulations on, uh, of how uh, how this looks like. Uh, there is uh, a paper by Olivares et al, uh, which is doing GRMHD in the uh, space time of a boson star. It is finding some outflows because, you know, it, on the other hand, it do doesn't have this uh, ultimate uh, uh, event horizon uh, location when everything just is, is just dumped and never returns. So this material that is infalling, really needs to go somewhere. So there will be outflows from this um, uh, boson star system. They will probably not be as energetic as you would expect from a black hole in the, at least in a, if, if the blandford Snake mechanism is efficiently uh, operating. But I, I would say it's kind of, I wouldn't say it's like a solved uh, uh, problem. Okay, perfect. I think that we are lack of the time. Your piece continue. Please be free to continue over the Slack. Thank you. Our last speaker is Dimitri Eisenberg from uh, Topingen. He is a postdoc fellow there, and he's going to talk about testing gravity with black or shadow sovereign. Please take it. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, so this was a project that I started working on after the first NGEHT meeting, uh, after some discussions and presentations. Uh, so I thought it'd be interesting to present. Um, there we go. Okay, so I think uh, the idea of subrings has been introduced enough, but basically the idea is you have, um, because your disk in, in, for M87 at least, probably for SAJ as well, your disk is optically thin. Uh, so you can see radiation coming uh, at higher order from the disk 
from multiple orbits, right? So this is what this is showing. You have your first image, direct image from the disk is your n equals zero, then you have n equals one after a half orbit and so on. Uh, and if you stack all of this radiation on the right-hand side, sort of shows what it would look like at different angles uh, along the image. So sort of the motivation for this whole project was that most studies on tests of gravity so far have used just the ideal shadow, but the ideal shadow isn't actually observable, right? What you would see are these thick subrings, which get progressively lower thickness and have fewer photons. Um, and so it's something that's definitely worth studying so we can see what, more realistically what we can do. Uh, and there's been a lot of studies on these subrings recently. Here's just a list of a few, there's plenty more. But most of these studies have focused just on measuring the mass and the spin and haven't really looked at, you know, if you toss in not knowing the inclination exactly, not knowing the disk model exactly, and also having a non curved black hole and whether or not that creates additional degeneracies. So the goal of this project is sort of, can we break these degeneracies using the subrings? You know, in principle, the low order subrings are primarily from astrophysics and the higher order ones should be purely geometry. So I wanted to see if that could be done. So for the disk model, I use just a very simple geometrically and optically thin disk. Uh, the emission is only coming from the equatorial plane. There's no scattering or fraction, anything like that. Um, for, so for the emission from the disk, I use just a simple radial power law, uh, but I also allowed for emission below the ISCO from gas that's infalling. Um, so this plot on the right just sort of shows just different uh, possible power law emissions. Um, the ones that fall off below these uh, solid vertical lines are the emission below the ISCO. So either it can fall off or it can continue along with the normal power law. And the blue and red is just different values of spin for the black hole. Uh, and the idea of using these different, different values of the power law and allowing either emit, uh, reduced emission below the ISCO or uh, the same emission below the ISCO is, is a proxy for uncertainties in your disk model. Um, since this model is overall fairly simple. Um, so for, for the non kerr metric, I use two different metrics. One is the Johansson metric, one is the Canopy Rotzola Jodenko metric, KRZ metric. Um, both of these are an M over R expansion uh, around Kerr. So adding extra parameters and those go as M over R. Um, the Johansson metric is specifically mo motivated by a post Newtonian expansion. Uh, while the KRZ is just a continued fraction expansion very near the horizon. Um, uh, the Johansson metric specifically still has a Carter-like constant, so it has the same type of symmetries as Kerr. KRZ does not necessarily have a Carter-like constant and it depends on which coefficients you look at. Um, and so at the bottom here, I'm just showing the TT component of the metric for the Johansson spacetime, just to show you what it looks like for the leading order parameters. Uh, KRZ is similar, but it's more complicated, so I didn't show it. Okay, so for the simulations and the analysis, so just did uh, basic ray tracing by solving the second order geodesic equations. I traced up to one and a half orbits, so that n equals three subring up to that. Um, now, since our telescopes that we're using have finite resolution, uh, what I did was I bin the photons. Uh, coming from the disk into two separate uh, binning resolutions. So one binning resolution, basically I had five radial bins across the image. Each radial bin was two, roughly two gravitational radii uh, and nine angular slices uh, over the image. So that, that's equivalent to about a 10 micro arc second resolution. Uh, and so it's sort of comparable to what NGHT will be able to do. The second resolution is uh, at one micro arc second, so that's something we would need a space-based version uh, to be able to do. Um, for the error estimation, I did something really simple. I didn't do any kind of uh, blurring or anything like that. I just averaged the intensity difference between the current bin and four adjacent bins. Uh, it's really simple, but it's something. 
Um, and then from that, I just did a basic likelihood analysis where the injected model is something like M87. So uh, I only use the spin of 0.94 and inclination of 163 degrees. Um, but I also very quickly looked at if the spins were different or the inclinations were different and the results are uh, about the same regardless of spin or inclination. And I analyzed it in three different ways. So first I looked at if we have the full image and we try to fit that full image, uh, if we just have the radii of the subrings and we fit that, or if we fit the ratio of the first, of the n equals zero and n equals one subring. Um, and so this is just to show you what those, what the simulated images look like, just as an, as an example. So on the left top, we have the, just the full image uh, with all the subrings. This is on a log scale, which is why you can see everything instead of just having a bright ring. Um, the central image is if you split up the subrings, uh, so n equals zero, n equals one, two, and three. Three you can obviously barely see, and then uh, on the top right you have uh, if you just plot those subrings and their uh, relative luminosity or relative intensity uh, uh, at different angular slices of the disk. Okay. So, so just some quick results for, if we use the one micro arc second resolution, the, so using the full image, the parameters are recovered perfectly within uh, the step sizes that I used. Uh, and that actually gives better precision than other current tests that are available. So that's, that's good news for the future, at least. Um, using just the subrings doesn't do as well. Uh, and that, so you can see the results here. I'm just plotting uh, likelihood here, uh, scaled in a funny way, but um, effectively, if a number is higher, you have a better chance of uh, that. That's what you think the result should be. Um, so you can see the mass, the inclination angle, and the disk model. So here it's the uh, this um, power law parameter. Uh, they re they recovered fairly well but the spin and the deformation parameter here are not recovered well at all. Uh, and there's a strong degeneracy between the two. Um, so this is something that we need to look at whether or not subrings are actually beneficial or if just using the full image is better. Um, so in the 10 micro arc second resolution, uh, it's not such good news. Uh, so the full image can recover some parameters. Um, so that's what I'm showing here. So this is the full image recovery. So the, the mass, uh, the power law factor and the inclination, and even the spin are somewhat well recovered, but you can see there's strong degeneracies between the spin uh, and the deformation parameter. And actually even the, the inclination is slightly wrong um, and the spin is recovered slightly wrong uh, and so on. And then if you just use subrings, you recover nothing. Um, effectively. And, and that's mainly because the subring, the uncertainty in that subring radius is just too large. Uh, you have leeway of two, something like two gravitation radii with this resolution. Um, and you're having such a large uh, uncertainty, you're not going to be able to extract any kind of information. So I hope that was quick enough. Uh, so just to conclude, space-based EHT, something like a space-based EHT seems to be very promising in the future. And hopefully like, with that, we'll be able to test GR and the current metric really, really well. Um, current EHT and energy EHT likely has too low of a resolution to make significant constraints. But maybe this is because the modeling analysis I did here is too simple, um, or other types of analyses could do better, like what Shahar suggested with the autocorrelations. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much for being so much on time. I think that we have time for a few questions. The first one is from Chi Yu Chen. Can you please uh, speak up? Yes, uh, thank you very much for this nice talk. So I have a question about the difference between the full image test and the submarine test. Yeah. So what is the reason for this difference? Did, did you, when you consider submarine test, did you just consider some, maybe an up to three or? So, um, so maybe I explained it poorly. So for the subring test, I just extracted the radius uh, of the brightest where, where it was brightest. 
for that. Set. Oh, okay, okay. So it's okay. just looking at the radius. For it. I see. Okay, thank you. The next, um, Sora, can you go? Yeah. Uh, so wonderful talk. I just wanted to ask that uh, you mentioned that there are uh, emission regions below ISCO radius. If I'm not wrong. Sorry yeah. if I missed that, but uh, could you please uh, uh, tell if uh, what sort of profile of or four velocity are using below ISCO? I mean, yeah, normally it's so, considered a free fall or you know just flowing on GUD six. So what profile have you considered here? Yeah. So it's following. So I just assume that uh, the energy and angular momentum of the particles uh, is the value it would have at the ISCO, and then it just follows a geodesic into the black hole. Um, uh, okay, so it's, it's a normal free fall, right? Yeah. So it, it, is it just uh, radially infalling or you know, just, just- No, uh, it's, it's on an orbital infall. Okay, okay, okay. all right. <laughs> okay, thank you so much everybody for attending this great, actually power session. I especially thanks all the speakers. Please keep going with your conversations over the Slack channel. I think that we are almost done. So if anybody wants to actually continue a little bit with the question, maybe we have just room for one or more like two questions. Otherwise, please feel free to go back to the main room. Any last question or topics of discussion? Well, maybe I could ask about boson stars again. At the right yeah, proportion. please go ahead. We have just like one or more two minutes. Yeah, why not? I mean, so my understanding is that with boson stars, you basically have some sort of scalar field or something like that. And so you have the, the gravity is general relativity like. And so, you know, if you're if you're not generating, if you're not generating photon rings, that's because you don't have enough, you know, gravitational bending to get the light to orbit around you. And it seems like if you have a boson star that's not of a given mass, it's not generating a photon ring while a black hole of the same mass is generating a photon ring, but the boson star has to be bigger. And is that not a valid assumption? Because if it was the same size, it would have the same gravity and it would do the same thing. And so it has to, it has to be bigger. Is that, is that a valid way of looking at this? Uh, I, I don't think it's exactly like that. Uh, so uh, of course, the space time needs to be Schwarzschild outside of the location of, well, for let's say, non, let's talk about non-spinning bosons that the one I was uh, showing was actually a, a spinning one. Uh, so it needs to be Schwarzschild outside of uh, region of importance of, uh, of this, uh, uh, whatever is this field. Uh, but I, yeah, it's, well, you know, uh, you have a, a proper metric of, of a boson star, it is uh, in the literature, it is not, it is not a Kerr metric, it is not a Schwarzschild metric. It doesn't need to be Schwarzschild everywhere, uh, because of course you, you have this uh, field, uh, right? So it's not a vacuum uh, solution. So it is some special uh, sort of solution within GR, but of course you can put it, uh, of course, also in a different gravity theory, right? So you can have this field put in, the, in, a, in a different uh, theory of gravity. But if we stick to, to GR, it's still not the case uh, that, uh, uh, that it need, I don't think it is the case that it, as simple as saying that it just needs to be larger uh, in, in size. Just a different metric with its own pro properties. So would a, a related question, would the boson star um, have hair, would it support non-oblate? Non I mean, would it support more than a J2 in its gravity field? Because black holes won't. So it, it has a lot of hair <laughs> because, uh, yeah, it's, it's, not a, it's not an object uh, uh, because the geometry of this, of, of this field may not be uh, simple, uh, meaning it has a lot of hairs. Uh, so, so that's yeah. a way of trying to find it. You, the perturbation in orbits, maybe photon orbits, but yeah. also maybe like stars I do expect, or something I do expect that's a, that's a valid way to do that. I, I do expect that, you know, we could also do tests of this 
boson star metric. I remember this object often being brought up by the gravity group as a alternative of a, of, of a black hole, as an object in the center of our galaxy. So from that, I gather that there is not enough support in the current measurements of the star's trajectories to exclude a boson star. But I, I agree with you. It should be, in principle, you find a star that is 10 times closer to, to such a star than from perturbation in the trajectories, you could see, uh, be seeing differences between uh, boson star and uh, and care solution. All right, well, thank you. Sounds great. Any other question? Or maybe you are better to address it in the channel stack. Sorry, in the stack channel, I apologize. Okay, I think that we are ready to go. So I'll see you in a, any momentary in the main session. Bye-bye.